conflict of interest and you might have for today's proceedings. Uh, hearing them, uh, the agenda we have in front of you. Any anything to add or change? Okay. Stephanie, you'd like to move that? Is there a seconder? Gara? All in favor? Great. That's the agenda before us then. And the minutes of April 16th meeting. Any errors or omissions? Hearing none, do I have an approver? Frank, thank you. And Rosemary, second. All in favor? Great. Motion carried. Minutes are passed. Uh, are there any, is there any business arising from those minutes? Good. Hearing none, I would like to call upon our CEO, Kathy, to give her report, please. Uh, so my report starts on page 9. Um, I just wanted to first of all acknowledge some um, of our physicians across the North who received awards at the recent Rural Health Conference that was held in Nanaimo. And uh, you'll see a team of physicians largely from the Northwest who received the Award of Excellence in Rural Medicine, Effective and Efficient Healthcare Partnerships in Rural BC uh, for an initiative called Change BC. And then uh, you'll also see that uh, Dr. Jeff Appleton, who used to be the medical director for the Northwest, received an award of excellence in rural medicine lifetime achievement award. So I just uh, think it's a great opportunity for us to congratulate these physicians on uh, these uh, achievements. Um, also just to highlight that before the North Central Local Government Association meetings that um, were held up in Fort Nelson at the beginning of May, uh, the day before those, we did host a uh, Healthy Communities Forum. Uh, Mandy, was, uh, who's with us today, was part of, of that. Um, and the title of that forum was Healthy, Sustainable and Thriving Communities. You'll see the objectives there for that uh, particular workshop. Uh, the forum included a, a presentation on a case for healthy communities. Plan H and the BC Healthy Communities Program uh, introduction and overview of those provincial um, resources, and then a presentation on nor the Northern Health Healthy Settings um, uh, initiative that we have underway, and it's really being embedded in how um, Sandra Allison's portfolio is being organized in the population health area. And then Fort Nelson did a really stellar presentation on. Um, some of the work that they've done to analyze the health status uh, of their particular community. And uh, they used uh, data and analyzed data and did a great presentation on uh, their analysis of Fort Nelson. <coughs> I'm losing my voice. Um, we then had in the afternoon a breakout session focused on asset ma mapping and needs assessment uh, related to both data and data analysis as well as moving forward with action. So that was a really uh, positive day. Uh, following that, um, um, we spent two days mm -hmm. in at NCLGA, Colleen and I, and um, had meetings with 20 communities uh, from uh, Northern British Columbia um, individually. Um, so just a couple of staffing updates from this part of our region. First of all, Peter Martin, who's with us today, has been appointed as the Health Service Administrator for Chatwin and Tumble Ridge, effective in April. Uh, prior to that, Peter was the Site Manager for Chatwin itself on an interim, in an interim role. 
So congratulations, Peter, and we're really pleased that you've agreed to take on that um, that responsibility. Um, in the Fort Nelson area, we've had two retirements. The health service administrator and the manager of patient care services um, have retired, and they were both very long-serving uh, leaders <coughs> in the Fort Nelson area and will be very much missed by Northern Health. Um, an individual named Leslie and Angela, I'm not sure if I'll get her last name right, but... Brindier. Brindier. I always say it wrong. <laughs> uh, but Leslie has um, started in the manager of patient care service role in uh, as of June 4th, and she is also a long-serving uh, registered nurse in that hospital, so very familiar with the community. And we are currently recruiting to the health service administrator position and have an interim site manager in place there. Angela's been spending quite a bit of time up in Fort Nelson while this transition has been occurring. Um, just a couple of uh, comments um, about something specific that we've been working on in Chetwin. We have had a community health uh, planning process going on in this community as well as in Fort Nelson. And um, we have had a steering committee that's consisted of First Nations community and representatives from the local municipal government um, overseeing with Northern Health the planning process. And then over the course of about three months, we consulted with about, I think, Angela, 200 people in the community. Uh, do you want to just describe how Gary went about that consultation? Because it was quite unique. Yeah, so I um, had a lot of work um, in terms of working with the district and um, the councillors in terms of how best to reach uh, the members within the community. And um, so he did things like arranging for seniors um, sit downs in the local A&W and people would just come and talk to them about what their health care needs were. He um, went out to targeted stakeholders in terms of uh, fire, ambulance, <coughs> Um, physicians, um, I believe they went out to the Social First Nations um, and West Moberly as well. Peter? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah and um, so and then the, they could um, the uh, member or the residents of this area could also respond by email um, to a survey as well. So really tried to do a kind of a broad spectrum um, uh, to get some input from um, the local residents about what they saw as their health care needs for the next two to five years. So a similar process was also conducted in Fort Nelson. So those uh, planning processes were completed in April of this year and there's a plan that has been produced uh, for each um, <laughs> each of the uh, communities called the Healthy Future, a community health plan for Chetwin and there's one for Fort Nelson as well. And uh, the Chetwin one has three priorities and I think Peter you'll probably talk about that a bit later. Um, a little bit in your presentation or um, actually I think it's Jason's Jason? present presentation okay. and, and we hadn't actually had that on. on okay no. that's fine then I'll tell you what the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good <laughs> so the first priority is to increase efforts to recruit and retain health care providers the second is to increase access to health care services locally and the third is improved supports related to mental health and substance use. And there is a steering committee that's been formed, and I believe the first meeting of that steering committee is on June 25th. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. Great. Um, so the next um, piece in my report I'm not going to speak to because later on the agenda we do have um, a full briefing on the Northern Health Connections Service, and Steve will be providing you with uh, an overview of, of that service. So that concludes my report, and I'll just turn it over to David to um, give um, an overview of the HR uh, report, and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay, okay thank you, Kathy. So uh, the HR report begins on page 12 of the package, and uh, this month we're, we're having a focus on our uh, human resources planning uh, portfolio, part of human resources. And our, our HR planning design team is a very small team, but are responsible for development and implementation of a workforce planning strategy for Northern Health. <laughs> um, and really what this is focusing on is understanding our workforce and planning for future needs uh, within the context of the Northern population. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, work in the Health Authority, but also uh, a lot of work provincially where we've been working with Ministry of Health <coughs> and other health authorities to provide them with a more provincial outlook on this information. Um, and using that information, recently the, the Ministry 
have, have, have identified a number of emerging issues within the healthcare sector, it's listed here for us, underutilisation <laughs> of the workforce, um, uh, high rates of employee on sick and injury leave, incidences of workplace violence, uh, and lack of leadership and change management resources. These, these are areas that we, we support in Northern Health as well. It's areas for us to, to, be, to be aware of. Uh, there have been a number of uh, provincial strategies also identified, and again, we, we're very supportive of building supporting the interdisciplinary team-based care, um, development of effective change management and leadership strategies, promoting health and wellness, and increasing training for cultural safety, humility, and trauma informed care. <laughs> so, as mentioned, uh, the, with the Integrated Health Human Resources Planning, that's the work we're doing at, at a provincial level with the Ministry of Health. Uh, again, they've been working with all the health authorities to, to get a bit of a picture of, uh, as a province. And in April 2018, they, they actually uh, produced a document called the Provincial Health Workforce Strategy. Uh, and this strategy paper uh, has been very helpful uh, for the health authorities and, and, and Ministry of Health to work together and identify um, some strategies. Uh, they've identified in this document four priority areas, primary care, those working with adult, adults with complex medical conditions, so or frailty, uh, mental health and substance use, uh, and surgical <coughs> services. Um, the five strategies are intended to respond to population needs and workforce, gap, workforce gaps over the next two fiscal years, and the, those are as follows. Training systems reflecting uh, anticipate demand for key occupations, so really plan more effectively uh, for what the gaps will be so that we can actually effectively plan it and get training opportunities in place up front. Uh, a more re flexible, responsive approach to recruitment retention. There's a lot of work being done uh, with health authorities and with Health Match BC, which is um, a provincial organisation that helps uh, with recruitment opportunities. Uh, optimise roles of practitioners to increase effectiveness is with, within the interdisciplinary teams. Uh, compensation models to support system transformation and uh, extend provincial workforce planning capacity, so more work like has like already been done with the Ministry of Health. In their document they identified 13 uh, key professions, that's on page 14, uh, and they've corresponded those to the four uh, priority areas uh, <coughs> by colour there, primary care, surgery, etc. This is provincial, but Northern Health actually shares seven of these priority professions, so physiotherapists, occupational therapists, nurse practitioners, uh, specialty trained uh, registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, healthcare assistants, and, and ultrasonographers. Uh, we continue to work uh, with the provincial strategy, but we actually take the work that we do with them and apply it to Northern Health uh, as we need to, because uh, the, the seven professions listed there are very difficult to fill. Um, some, some areas more difficult to fill than others, uh, but we actually need to be aware of these as, as challenges for we have to, to, to move on. Uh, we're also working on a, a, a hate, you know, or, do, or refocusing our human resources strategy, uh, not only to be directly aligned with the provincial workforce uh, plan, uh, because there's lots of synergy there, but also, as you see on page 15, there's a, there's a figure there that explains our, our HR strategy is going to be uh, directed by, of course, the Northern Health strategic priorities, uh, but we are there to support those priorities. Um, the buckets of work underneath um, are really break down the work that's been undertaken uh, throughout Northern Health, and work, workforce planning and sustainability, recruitment and retention, education training and development of leaders, uh, and supportive health and safe workplace. I do want to be clear that this is not just human resources portfolio buckets of work. This is um, professional practice, education services, <coughs> IT, finance, public health. It, it's operations are uh, a part of this work. We're just going to be helped develop in a strategy for us, so it's very clear for us. Um, we've talked about it before at board about our workforce planning uh, toolkits. This is really at the, the front, front line of, of, of the work that we're doing. This is where we're speaking to managers, we're giving them their work, work first, workforce profile reports, which includes um, uh, demographics of, of, of the staff that they currently have, the gaps that they may have right now, uh, analysis of their casual pool and relief pools, uh, metrics for churn and turnover, time to fill, which is how long it takes us to fill a position, and difficult to fill, those are the positions that have posted 90 days or more, information about those, some hours analysis, so this is how much overtime, how much six time, um, 
uh, uh, information for them to have. So they've got the information as of now. What that does is enable human resources and other departments to support these managers in a more effective way of planning for the future, identifying those gaps uh, and making plans today. What's really important to remember is the manager in the front lines also knows a bunch of stuff that the data doesn't tell us. They know about staff that may be planning in the future to... You to have a uh, musical background. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just moving. I'm just, okay. just moving on. Um, managers in the front line, they know so what's sorry. going on with staff. They recognise that, uh, you know, that they know old oh, so-and-so may be thinking about uh, relocating with their husband, so-and-so may be considering uh, retirement. They know about it more earlier than we do, so it's really important that we have those discussions at that level. And from there, we create an action plan, uh, which then drives Northern House Human Resources uh, plan, which also helps us get more effective data uh, and information to the uh, Ministry of Health Provincial uh, plan. Uh, we're hoping to have uh, not only, we will have 80% of departments with more than three, time, three full time equivalents um, having at least uh, one uh, session with us by the end of this, uh, this calendar year. And uh, the, there's page 17, it gives you a, bit of a, a schedule of the work that we're doing. There's been a lot done. The next step is how to effectively report um, as we move forward. On page 18, uh, we're looking at the, some of the, our recruitment data. Um, and uh, so, where we started off with, just to, to confirm for everyone, in uh, the fiscal 17-18, we post over 3,000 positions uh, in Northern Health, both internal and external. 82% were filled by internal staff. So that's existing uh, regular staff or casual staff that are already hired by Northern Health. 10% were filled by external uh, qualified applicants from outside Northern Health. So these are folks that we brought in from outside Northern Health into regular uh, positions. Um, there are still some unfilled positions going through the competition phase, and then uh, positions that remain unfilled for more than 90 days become what we term as difficult to fill vacancies. On average, about 6% of those 3,000 positions uh, will end up going to difficult to fill. That is, it does sometimes go up and it has gone down, um, but that's about the average, and that's, that's the real important piece for us to start reducing that gap of the number of difficult to fill positions and normal out experiences. Casual hires not reflected in this data, but on average we hire about a thousand casuals into the workforce over, <coughs> over a fiscal or calendar year, which explains why uh, many of our uh, uh, positions are filled from internal resources. Uh, this data has changed slightly from the data the board has seen before, uh, it, because we've removed nurse practitioners from this data, um, because it's now been reported through the position. Uh, we continue uh, to, to Recruitment continues to focus on many strategies to help address that difficult to fill uh, challenge that we face. Uh, utilising social media differently. Um, we've undertaken a number of local think tank sessions where we're actually going out into the field, uh, speaking to the frontline managers about the challenges they're expecting, experiencing, and I'm trying to understand from their perspective what can we change to meet our immediate needs. We have many long-term strategies, but what can we change to, to support uh, right now? Um, and of course, we continue to go to both national and international um, uh, recruitment events. Um, again, partnered with Health Match BC, which is a very good resource uh, for, for both physicians um, and for nursing positions for Northern Health. Uh, the, the diagram at the end of the chart, at the bottom of this page 19, is the, an outline of our difficult to fill positions. Uh, this is um, displayed uh, by employee types, so it's community managers, um, uh, facility subsectors, the nurses agreements. Um, it's also broken down by geographical area, and you'll note it's also broken down by permanent and relief. Um, so the permanent ones are those regular ongoing jobs, the relief positions are those temporary positions for, for short term work, or are positions that have been posted because a regular position uh, incumbent has gone on some form of leave. The majority um, of um, our leaves are for maternity leaves right now. So that's an example of a young workforce that we have in many of our areas. And finally on page 20 um, is the, the, the face of Norman now, which just gives us a bit of information about uh, the makeup of the workforce um, by full-time, part-time, casual, by the collective agreements. Um, and uh, information is there for you. 
Thank you. David, allow me to apologize to you for my phone <laughs> ringing. I was going to pretend it wasn't mine, but I thought, no, that would work. <laughs> Are there any questions from uh, board directors for David or Kathy? Hearing none, let's move on then. Thank you for that. Audit and Finance Committee, I'd like to ask our Chair of the Audit and Finance Committee, Ben Sander, to introduce the subject, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, if, if, if I may, uh, at this time I'd like to ask uh, Mark, our CFO, to walk us through the 2017-18 year end update and the capital expenditure plan update. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my report starts on page 21 of the package, and this is just to give the, the board an update on the, uh, on, on the audit. Uh, so as the board is aware, uh, PwC Price Waterhouse Coopers was uh, was appointed to audit the, the 2017-18 financial statements. So this is the, the first of a five-year term. Um, so in terms of uh, where we're at in the process right now, uh, the board approved the financial statements. There are some final procedures that the auditors need to complete. I uh, don't anticipate any issues with those. But once they complete those procedures, uh, we'll be forwarding the, the financial statements to the ministry for its uh, review and approval to release to the general public. And when it does get approved, we'll be uh, posting it on our, on our website. In terms of timing of that, uh, usually it occurs when, well, it does occur with the release of the, the BC public accounts. So the BC public accounts is uh, government releasing its financial uh, statements for the fiscal year just ended along with the, uh, the other government-related entities, all health authorities, um, universities, and other department uh, uh, government-related entities. So I anticipate that usually occurs around um, end of June. Um, but we'll see. Are there any questions for Mark on the uh, financial statements? Okay. Mark, would you like to take us through the uh, capital expenditure plan update, please? Thank you. So this report uh, provides information on uh, uh, our progress <laughs> on the 17-18 uh, capital plan. Uh, just a reminder, that plan was approved in February 2017, and there were uh, some amendments uh, over the course of the first year. Uh, the, the plan itself, uh, revenues of, uh, we're expecting revenues of $49.4 million and corresponding expenditures to match. So in terms of funding, we get funding from the Minister of Health, uh, the six regional hospital districts, foundations, auxiliaries, and other, other partners, uh, as well as Northern Health contributes money into the plan. So for 17-18, we spent about $28.9 million towards, uh, on that plan. Uh, the top of page 23 identifies some of the, 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 the reasons for the uh, lower spending this year. Uh, unfortunately, we had delays in tendering and uh, there's some equipment delays. Uh, the projects are still in place. They're just, uh, just getting pushed into the 18-19 uh, year along with the related funding. Um, the, some, some the table describes some of the uh, significant projects that, uh, that, are, that are, in the, are in the way in 17-18 uh, uh, in the Northeast, uh, Fort Nelson, uh, we have on the slate to replace the uh, medication uh, dispensing cabinet. That, that project has been placed on hold uh, due to some uh, recruitment <coughs> challenges that had at the uh, senior levels uh, at, in, in Fort Nelson. Um, we have trying to deal with the, uh, uh, the, the leadership challenge and executing a proper project. Uh, the, this extent was, uh, was a bit too much, so we asked that we could we could uh, just delay it. So it's not canceled, it's just being postponed. We did, uh, did hear yesterday that the, uh, the medication cabinet in Chetwin has is, is in place and it's, it's been running for, for, for 10 days. Um, the MRI uh, in Fort St. John, uh, that's also in place, it says closing. Uh, there's some, still some financial uh, year, uh, and pr procedures we need to do. But the unit itself is in operation and is taking, and we're doing MRIs in Port St. John. I won't uh, go through the rest of the project uh, for the Northwest and the Northern Interior. Um, I want to say, uh, 
that there, we also receive funding for, so the report highlighted the, the major capital for this, but we do also receive funding from our partner, uh, Ministry of Health, Regional Hospital District, for minor equipment, so projects less than $100,000. And for 1718, we spent about $10.4 million on, on these projects. And I could use money for it. Yeah, but I, if I could just add that um, the uh, contributions that we receive from the RHDs and the foundations really make a huge difference to what we're able to do in the capital of the space. And I know there's at least one RHD member here, so I want to acknowledge the contributions that have been made to. Uh, to Northern Health over the years and in this last year. They really do uh, enable us to improve the quality of services that we provide. So thank you, Mark. Are there any questions from directors to Mark on this topic? So we have a motion before us. The motion reads, the Northern Health Board receives the 2017-18 period 13 capital expenditure plan update as presented. Do I have a mover, please? Ben, seconder Edward, all in favor? Motion carried. Okay, so at this time, I'd like to ask the chair of our Performance Planning and Priorities Committee, Stephanie Killam, to introduce the subject, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have uh, two uh, strategic priority areas that we're going to deal with this morning, or this afternoon. No, we're still in the morning, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know that. So uh, the first one is uh, our uh, priority is healthy people and healthy communities. And Dr. Allison is going to um, introduce the presenters on uh, the health report and the community grant. Dr. Allison. Thank you, Stephanie. So thanks very much for this opportunity. Um, I have two guests here today. The first one is Dr. John Kim. He's the Northeast Medical Health Officer position in Fort St. John. And he's working closely with the um, population health team and is going to speak to our regional action plan for preventing injuries. So thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, should I speak from here or something like that? I think you go up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Although it might be tough for the camera. Hmm. Hi, so thank you so much for kind of inviting us to talk about the injury prevention and just, just quickly clarify that uh, just on the, that I'm the Northeast uh, Medicare's officer and the Kelsey, uh, my co-speaker, uh, is unfortunately not able to come here today, but she and her team uh, provided uh, not only the presentation, but they are the ones who are leading the actual injury prevention work. And uh, we'll talk about kind of uh, how we make the people in the Northern BC kind of healthier by preventing the injury. And the Mandy after me gonna talk about how do we actually support the community who take, uh, which take the initiative to make their communities healthy. So just gonna start talking about the injury. So the injury is basically you are having the physical harm. So they're gonna be the host that getting the physical harm. They're gonna be the agent that causing the physical harm. And that's gonna happen in the environment that can be physical, not the host and agents moving around. That can be also social. There's the policies, there's the cultural norms, and uh, there's the kind of economic factors play into that. So how do we prevent the injury? Well, prevent the injury means we want to reduce the risk of people actually getting injured. And if they get injured, we want to reduce the severity of that injury. And we talk about the host, agent, and environment. So preventing the injury, we need to work on all of those. For example, a provincial health officer uh, made a report about the kind of rubber meat rule, and they made a recommendation based on what's called safe systems approach, in which we create the environment, we share the responsibility, and we create the environment uh, in which the individuals are kind of uh, working in, in a setting that is by default they're not getting injured. So it's not just about the safe road users, it's about also safe vehicles, it's also about the safe speed where the vehicle is moving around, also it's about the safe road. And when we actually do that, when we create that safe system when the individual is not getting injured, we can actually prevent 80 to 90 percentage of the injury. So do we actually need to make a difference on injury in the north? In the BC, we know that for the population age 1 to 44, uh, injury is the number one cause of the mortality. And in the north, we kind of, uh, this is kind of illustrate uh, the burden of the injury in the north. So among the injury, uh, track related uh, injuries are one of the main uh, contributor for injury related burdens. 
And this graph, uh, it's a standard, standardized mortality ratio for the trepid-related uh, kind of fatality. So that straight line is a DC1. And it demonstrates the other kind of health authorities, like well, how, by the ratio, how high their mortality or lower their mortality is compared to DC upper, uh, average. And this top line is on northern health. So that means at the absolute level, we have a significant burden of injury from the traffic-related injuries. And relatively, we are high. And another thing, this trend is going up. But that's not where we want to be at. So well, we do need to make the differences for the injuries. Then can we make the differences? I talked about that we can actually prevent 80 to 90% of injuries. That's not just a theory. We have a very concrete intervention and we have a good evidence when we implement that, we actually make a big difference. Like we actually kind of mandate the helmet, like wearing the helmet and we actually kind of enforce that and provide a good education. We can prevent a third of, third of the head injuries. And if we actually kind of implement uh, kind of the lower speed limits and enforce that and provide education and driving, uh, uh, education and driving, we can actually make a huge difference uh, for the driving too. So we can make a huge difference uh, in the injuries. But if we can, so if we have a need to make a difference in injury in the nurse, and if we can actually can modify the burden of injuries, should we make a difference? Should it be our priority at this point of time? Northern else actually are ready to actually make a difference. We have a very strong foundation. In 2012, Northern Health endorsed position paper on the injury prevention. That means we actually created dedicated resources and staff with the expertise around the injury prevention, which are ready to take the leading role, uh, kind of the efforts to kind of coordinate injury prevention in the Northern Hills. A second part is the timing is right. There are opportunities created across the province. In 2013, uh, BC Guiding Frame uh, work for the public health identified key priority areas for the public health for entire province. One of them is injury prevention. Based on their priority, in 2015, a BC Injury Prevention Committee started working on what are the priority areas within that injury prevention. And they identify seniors' fall, traffic-related injuries, and youth suicide. And now they really start to working on building the surveillance system, collecting the data at the provincial level. Also thinking about doing some kind of guiding, uh, guiding framework and recommendations that we can actually make the difference for the interventions. And they're actually creating some resources. This size opportunity, we should leverage. So we should prioritize uh, injury prevention right at this point in time. So how do we do that in the Northern Health? We just talked about the injury prevention. It's not a simple work. It's a multiple partner we need to work with. It's a multiple problem approach we need to work with. Create a safe system where by default individuals not getting injured. So in the Northern Health, we have kind of started working on regional action plan for injury prevention. A key part of that is creating this steering committee. This steering committee is going to have that information capacity that collect, interpret, and disseminate the data and continue to monitor. So our priorities are set based on the data for the Northern BC community, that population we serve. And also, it's going to have the ability to the environment to scan and connect with the provincial committees. So our recommendation around the specific intervention will be evidence-based. Another capacity this steering committee is going to have is the partnership building capacity. For those injury prevention kind of priority, like seniors fall or traffic-related injuries, they share some partners, but also it requires a very different set of wide variety of partners. So this steering committee through the uh, regional action plan, we'll be able to build a partner within the organization and reach out to the partners in the community and outside in different organizations. And we will ensure that each of those injury prevention areas will be have a very focused kind of planning. As well, at the larger level, we're gonna coordinate all those working with the different partners and different priorities. So we're actually gonna have efficiency when we make a different injury prevention. So this actually creating the regional action plan for injury prevention is endorsed by the ex executive members of uh, Northern Health. And uh, we will go back in 12 months to report what progress uh, we've made. So what progress we've made and what progress are coming. So we started working on the regional action plan. 
Also, we also uh, kind of championed by the Dr. Ellison, we reformed a uh, kind of Northern Road Health Coalition, bringing the kind of partner <coughs> stakeholders within the Northern Health as well as outside the Northern Health, including <coughs> RCMP, ICBC, and even BC Truckers Association. And we are starting to build in the partnership. We put them together, sitting on the table together, and talking about how do we reduce this burden uh, from track-related injuries. This has been a great success. So we're actually going to kind of replicate that work uh, with the community, uh, preventing the seniors fall in the community. Again, we're going to reach out to partners. We're going to build intersectoral kind of partnership uh, through this coalition. And so we can, can embark on uh, reducing the burden of the falls for the seniors living in the communities. So just quickly touch base on the Chapman. So Chapman, uh, we kind of through that kind of community surveys, and so we're aware that communities are concerned about the traffic-related injuries, especially related, related to the community, uh, commercial vehicles. And Chapman, while it's a young kind of community, just like in many of the older northern communities, facing the population which are aging, and older people actually stay in the community. So this work, uh, kind of preventing the track related injuries, senior spot, and other priorities, will make a difference uh, for the checkmate. And we will make that difference by kind of building those partnership with the multiple stakeholders, putting into that multi-prone kind of strategies, and we will provide the sustained kind of efforts and resources to ensure that we make a difference. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Are there any, yes? Very, uh, very good presentation, and the uh, standard mortality rate related to this is very sobering. So the work that you're doing with the uh, the committees and the action plan is is phenomenal. Are there any questions from the directors? Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Thank you. So yes, the next subject is years of community granting. Yes. Dr. Allison, would you like to introduce? Thanks again. Um, I think it's really a great um, honor that we get two presentations <laughs> in the public session, but I'm also very proud of the work of my team. So Mandy Labatt, one of our Healthy Settings Advisors um, and lead for the Community Granting Program, is going to tell us about all the excellent work. So thanks very much, Mandy, for making the trip here to Chilton. Thank you, and thank you all for having me. So I am the, um, the NI lead, that's my HSDA that I cover through my Healthy Settings portfolio. Um, the Imagine Community Grants have also been um, a big part of my portfolio for the past two and a half years, so I'm really um, pleased to be here today to share some of this with you. I am going to kind of try and stick to my notes because I'm with a lot of from nerves. Um, there's a lot of information. I'm super passionate about this program, so I want to make sure that I am covering my bases. So why community granting? Why do we do community granting? So for Northern Health, um, what we're doing is we're supporting community-led action. Um, that promotes health and prevents injury and chronic disease in community. Granting is a way that we care for our communities in the north. Um, we do this by using an upstream approach and how we engage with all of our communities across the north and how we can also reach broader populations, those broader population groups um, in all of our settings as well. Um, one of the main things with Imagine Community Grants program and um, it really aligns with our strategic plan. So right at the top of our strategic plan, priority number one, um, having healthy people in healthy communities. That's a main priority for the Community Grants Program. Um, this, this program has been supporting communities um, since 2008, 2009. So we have been doing the Imagine Program um, in Northern Health for the past 10 years. Over those past 10 years, various um, partners um, within Northern Health have supported the Imagine Program while the population health, health programs have historically been the ones that have managed the program, but there have been a number of um, partners along the way. Um, and with that, of course, a whole decade of community granting, there have been a number of changes over those years, so I'm going to talk to you about a few of those today. So we've really focused on quality improvement program, pro, uh, sorry, we've uh, really focused on quality improvement processes. Um, specifically over the past two and a half years that I've been in my role. And again, that aligns with our Northern Health Strategic Priority number three, which is quality. We want to keep um, providing the best program and services that we can. And I'm going to share some of the, um, those highlights with you today. 
Um, so prior to 2016, our project focus areas and priorities um, for the granting, for the granting criteria, were set based on um, whoever the partners were at the table at that time. So for example, um, we had a, a stream of granting that was called Heart Health because we had cardiac care and cerebrovascular services at the table providing funding. So um, that partner wanted those program, um, projects to align with Heart Health. Um, in 2015, with the um, Canada Winter Games, we really wanted to leverage the excitement around the games and focus on promoting physical activity. So that year, our priority was physical activity. Um, so as part of the improvement process, though, um, since 2016, we've really wanted to streamline our priorities, um, and we've done so by aligning them with Healthy Families BC policy framework. So not only do those priorities align with our program priorities, and with the BC Guiding Framework that Dr. Kim alluded to, um, but they're also consistent and really streamlined for our partners out in communities. So those people applicating or app people that are applying on the um, the grant, so they know what to expect. They know that um, they can focus those specific um, project um, priorities when they're um, planning their projects. Um, so having dedicated staff um, in this role has really improved support for applicants and communities. So prior to this, um, again, it was whoever was at, around the table, the work was kind of done off the side of the desk, managed by um, population health. Um, but having the dedicated staff has really improved the support um, and outreach to the communities. Um, and part of that has been not only the connecting one-on-one -on -one with applicants, but also we now have improved our application forms um, we're consistently updating our web page to ensure that um, applicants have the tools and resources they need to support the application process. Um, being in my role, I've also um, been able to increase the follow-up on outstanding evaluation reports. The evaluation reports are really <coughs> integral to our program. It's what we use to be able to share all the good work across the north. So we use the evalu evaluation reports and connecting with those projects to be able to share their stories, their photos. Um, through um, our improvement processes, we've also brought on some new partners and funders. So Indigenous Health Program within Northern Health has been a new partner. Um, we also have really strong partnerships with our executive and program leads within Northern Health. And those partners, um, we, use, we're, we partner with them to support um, the screening process myself and depending who's at the screening table for each cycle, we're not necessarily the content experts. So we will look to those content experts um, to ensure that the projects, they are, um, they support best practice and evidence so that we know good work is happening in communities. And the last one, multiple cycles per year. So prior to 2016, we only offered um, Imagine funding once a year to communities. Part of the feedback process um, from community was that they wanted to see the opportunity offered more often. So we, are, we now offer two cycles a year, and we do that seasonally, because that supports um, the seasonal projects and the timelines of our applicants. Uh, another um, quality improvement we have done is um, we really focused on how we promote the program. So we now have an annual communication strategy um, this way we are able to share granting success stories publicly. <coughs> we do that through social media, the Healthier You magazine, and local media opportunities. So we work um, with our Northern Health Communications Department, so Steve's department, um, and develop that plan annually. And um, one of the great things that is part of that strategy is this Google map here, you'll see. So people can access this Google map from our, Nor our Imagine webpage and they can learn more about projects, they can see what types of projects have been funded in what certain communities. And I just checked this morning, and there's almost, we're like 50 short of 26,000 unique views. So this, um, one of the communications advisor supported the development of this Google map in 2016. So it's only been two years, mm -hmm. and that map has had almost 26,000 unique views. So it's not just me. <laughs> 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 I check this Google map a bunch of times, it's unique views. So it's great to see that um, it's a tool that's really being used to promote the <coughs> program. Um, we do have improved tracking and evaluation processes that allow us to more easily, easily share how the um, Imagine Grants are impacting um, communities. I already said that's what we use to share and promote. 
Um, in partnership with the Northern Health Research and Evaluation Department, we've developed an application assessment tool. Um, and that tool helps us to screen for populations who may be vulnerable or disadvantaged. Um, Imagine is an inclusive program. So we are available and open to all community groups um, across the north, so nonprofit societies, schools, PACs, local governments, um, Indigenous groups, First Nations bands. So it really is an inclusive program that everyone um, can apply to. Uh, and that screening assessment tool that we developed, it is only one tool. When you, we're going through the screening process, there are a lot of elements for us to consider, um, um, considering equity across the north as well. We expand our lens each cycle um, to ensure that one HSDA or one specific community isn't getting underfunded. We also look for those areas that are underserviced um, and specific communities or groups that may be underserviced. And the last one that I put on there, um, improved coordination with uh, finance for fund distribution, which may seem quite um, like a simple thing, but actually um, just the streamlining of the processes and the processes that we have put in place really um, provides quick turnaround now for when we're closing the granting um, process and being able to get that funding quickly out to communities that need to get their projects started. So we're happy, finance is happy, it's great. <laughs> Uh, this table here, this just kind of summarizes all of the amazing stuff that has happened, um, the annual funding we've been able to provide to Northern Health Communities over the past 10 years. So we have been able to support 822 projects for over $2.3 million in community across the North, which is just fantastic. Um, you'll see from 2015-16 there, um, again, where we started improving our record keeping um, we now track the number of applications, the number of communities, and the number of new applicants, which is, I think is very important because we want to be giving people the opportunity. Previously, um, maybe because a little bit of lack of promotion of the program, and um, there were some gung-ho groups that really knew about the program and it would apply every year, so um, having the new applicants, we're wanting to give more people a chance, so we're not funding the same people, same projects over and over again. So, so opportunities. So again, with focus on continuous quality improvement for the program, we are always looking for opportunities to expand the program and to improve the way we do things within the program. So obviously we would welcome increased partnership engagement, so it's not only funding, but um, people that are interested in, in doing this community's work and investing in um, health of the community and being part of you in the screening <coughs> process or um, new ideas um, for how for processes. Um, obviously we would love to see guaranteed financial commitment from other programs within Northern Health. I got excited listening to Mark talk about big numbers. <laughs> um, but I also want to say that population health and primary and community care are the are currently the only two programs within Northern Health that provide um, annualized committed funding to the program. So Kelly is in the room. So thank you, Kelly, for your support to the program of healthy communities work. It's great having your partnership. And then much more, much more because really I think the sky's the limit. Um, we're open to partnering with other internal programs within Northern Health. Um, we're also open to partnering with external programs. So um, Dr. Sandra Allison, as, along with um, the director, Kelsey Yarmish, and my regional manager, Shalan Zerl, they um, attended the All Foundations gathering in Smithers last month and actually had the opportunity um, to discuss healthy communities work and specifically the Imagine Grants program. So. Um, Perhaps there may be some exciting opportunities that come from that. I'll cross my fingers, um, <laughs> we'll see. Um, but what I'd like to share is, and what I appreciate the most about this program is how it supports um, community engagement and community healthy community development. We know that people in communities know their communities best. They're the ones um, that can identify the needs within their, within their community and who to bring to the table to ensure that um, they can make those ideas come to life. So, and making healthy communities where people live, work, and play. So, I could just, I could go on and on about this program. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, and I will share, um, I know some people, um, some of our executive members may have seen heard this story before, but I will share because it is one that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, this was a project application from Kispiox, BC. The project was called Elders Day. They had requested just over $1,300 um, to purchase axes, shovels, and gloves. And what they wanted to do was to um, chop and stack wood and clear walkways and driveways for their elders in their community. So um, we thought the pro obviously we thought the project was amazing. Um, we did reach out to them and uh, made a recommendation that they put an injury prevention lens on the project. And um, we suggested that they get safety glasses um, to ensure that the boys kept their eyes safe. And you'll see in the photo there, it wasn't exactly the safety glasses we were envisioning, but they did look really <laughs> cool sunglasses. So they were uh, protecting their eyes and looking cool at the same time. So, um, But what I also want to add about this, um, so $1,300, they did all that. It's an ongoing, sustainable project. They came back at the end when they handed in their evaluation form and they um, said they had $200 left over. And could they buy rakes and garbage bags because they had such a great, it was such great community response that they wanted to um, now support the elders and the rest of the community again for spring and summer. Mm -hmm. So it truly is ongoing, sustainable, and um, fantastic. I mean, you can read the quote there. And it's made a big difference in the community. So. Uh, sorry, just in closing, um, a, the big part of me being here today, um, again, is celebrating 10 years of Imagine Community Grants. Um, you will um, receive one of these reports. This is our, um, affectionately around our department, it's called the Big Glossy. Mm -hmm. the first time we've developed um, a report on Imagine Granting. And it's basically, we just want to develop, um, wanted to share, promote, and highlight the great work that the communities are doing. So I just help support the processes. It's really the communities that are making massive impacts across the north for us to get this work done. Um, and really, we wanted to create something tangible to put in people's hands. We do a lot of our promotion on the web and um, through social media. So we wanted to um, be able to put these in people's hands and they could look at the beautiful pictures and um, read the quotes specifically from the, um, the applicants themselves. So. It's just a snippet because there's 822 projects, so um, that would be kind of hard. <laughs> but um, please, I really encourage you to share, to get your hands on these, to share them, to share them widely in your communities with your partners. Um, I have, get in touch with me if you want more, I can send them out to you. I just really want to um, ensure that um, the projects get the recognition. Again, it's the people and it's, it's great to see the work they're doing. Um, if you go right to the middle of the book, there's actually a really great project that they did here in Chetwind a couple years ago. It's called Imagine Chetwind mm -hmm. at the Chetwind Visitor Center. So they bought this candy red bicycle and it's a double seater. So they have it at the Visitor Center and um, locals and visitors to the community use the bike to um, travel around, active, promoting active transportation and they have their helmets so they're promoting, preventing injury. So um, that's just one of them. We have um, provided Imagine Grants, again, since our quality improvement for me tracking. Um, so 2015, there's been 11 different uh, projects within the Chetwind area, so Soto, First Nation, and Moberly Lake as well. Um, 11 different projects, totaling just over $51,000. So Chetwind is um, a really great promoter of the Imagine program as well. So thank you all. Amanda, you did a great presentation. I have no idea why you were nervous. <laughs> Very informative. And um, the work you guys are doing is phenomenal. I were really uh, Please pass on the appreciation of the board to those that you work with. Good job. But are there any questions from directors? No, she just does a bad job. Yes. I'll just make one comment that just to connect to your work. Um, the Road Health Coalition that you heard about earlier was established because of interest from the board in addressing uh, injury that they were seeing in some of the health status reports that David Bowering at the time who was the chief medical health officer was bringing to the board 
and um, uh, that stimulated the the formation of the first road health coalition. So, and then the second piece was after the consultation process. Let's talk about health, which was our very first public consultation process in 2005 to or 2005 2006. Uh, the idea of the Imagine Grants came from that public consultation mm -hmm. process that the board undertook. And then your team uh, just really took that and moved that forward. So just a bit of history for you in terms of governor, your role as governors and your influence on some of the work that we do inside Northern Health related to this strategic priority. Fantastic. Edward? Well, thank you for that presentation. It was fascinating, this example, uh, $1,300, buy a few tools. Those tools will be around for years. And I know some of the other projects that you've done, whether it's buying cross-country ski boots or something like that. The, we heard from Dr. Kim about the, the power of the, the partnerships. Are there uh, opportunities to partner with foundations, with uh, hospital auxiliaries to maybe acquire. Uh, traditionally, those organizations have bought uh, equipment for inside the hospital, uh, <coughs> but it, presumably it could be for equipment outside the hospital to keep people, people healthy as well. We hope so. Yeah. Um, that was part of the presentation at the All Foundations Gathering. I think that that is what Dr. Allison and Kelsey and Shalan were trying to. Um, to achieve there, to get them thinking outside of the box, not just the big capital expenditures, <laughs> which are very important to, for our health services, but um, look how much a small amount of money can make a difference in the community. So um, just to get those foundations starting to think about um, different ways to support communities more broadly. Maybe Steve, do you have something? Yes, uh, <coughs> uh, great question. We, uh, Sandy and her team, presented at the All Foundations Conference because we are now starting that conversation to think beyond the traditional MRI, CT scanner, and how foundations can be influencers and significant influencers in the communities through a partnership with the Imagine Granting process. So we just had that presentation, went very, very well with the foundations. For some of them, it actually means changing their constitution and bylaws yes. to do that work. Yeah. Um, but to the, uh, all of them that they were, where they were interested in exploring how they might be able to do some of this type of work in a different way going forward. So yeah, we've, we've, we've stuck our foot in the water and we're, we're moving down that pathway. Edward, thanks so much, it's a great question. I call it going beyond the blanket warmer because I really think that these impacts in the community have just such depth and uh, really are um, <coughs> activating mechanisms for that community to start tending to their health. So, Really looking forward to new opportunities, hopefully. Great discussion, and thank you, Mandy, again. Good job. Okay, so we will move on now to um, strategic priority quality, mental health and addictions. Kelly. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a briefing note on uh, page 34 of your package. Uh, this is uh, one of uh, seven clinical uh, quality programs in the Health Authority, and this particular portfolio, um, the Mental Health and Substance Use Program, is uh, led out by Michelle Lawrence, Executive Lead, uh, Dr. Gerard Prigmore, who's the Medical Lead uh, with uh, specialized uh, knowledge and expertise in addictions medicine, and Dr. Bart Kane, a uh, psychiatrist uh, from Prince George, uh, who is the Medical Lead for the Mental Health component. Uh, of, the, of the program. Uh, the body of work that I'm going to discuss with you today aligns with three priorities in our strategic plan, uh, healthy people and healthy communities, coordinated accessible services, and quality. Um, I'm going to describe the work. I'm going to take a little bit of liberty with the briefing note. Um, there are two broad ca uh, categories of work uh, in this program. Uh, the first category is setting standards for quality uh, and, um, and regional planning exercises. And the second uh, category of work is focused quality improvement. Um, under the uh, uh, regional planning piece, I just want to bring together two uh, strategic planning exercises uh, where we're developing strategies um, and discuss them together even though they are discussed in your briefing notes separately. Uh, so one of the uh, major areas of focus for this program uh, in the last uh, year has been to develop uh, an overall mental health and substance use strategy, uh, as well as a service model. And this is a collaborative effort uh, from the program, um, our division partners uh, and physicians, 
uh, and the First Nations Health Authority, and uh, the strategy and the service model are still very much in development, although, of course, we are delivering services uh, while we uh, uh, solidify that. Um, this strategy uh, will encompass um, uh, the full spectrum of care from prevention, uh, reducing stigma of mental health and substance use issues, uh, to the higher intensity um, uh, services that we offer in our hospitals. Uh, within this broader uh, strategy, uh, there is some focused work on the opioid uh, response uh, crisis. And um, in your briefing note on page 37, uh, you'll see the elements of a detailed implementation plan uh, that is um, being executed uh, now. So the elements of that plan are uh, drug checking for safety. So this is where uh, drugs are checked for contaminants uh, like fentanyl. Um, overdose uh, prevention services and supervised consumption. Addictions uh, treatment uh, interventions such as methadone and suboxone initiated by uh, physicians and nurse practitioners and uh, maintained by those same uh, primary care providers. Um, the work that we do in our hospitals and our emergency department uh, to uh, respond effectively to people um, and uh, to um, approach their care from a trauma-informed um, perspective. Um, we're developing search um, uh, capacity. We've added four beds uh, that allows us to um, be more responsive um, in the presence of um, a greater intensity of, of need uh, of the person. Um, addressing chronic pain as a root cause uh, of, of many um, substance use issues in particular. Uh, and uh, education and training and data analysis so that we know that the work that we're doing uh, is actually having the uh, intended positive effect for people. Uh, also in the um, uh, planning uh, area, uh, I'll just uh, move your attention in the briefing note to the mobile support teams. Uh, in, par in partnership with the First Nations Health Authority, uh, we've developed a plan to mobilize uh, 10 uh, mobile support teams. Uh, and these uh, 10 teams are being implemented in two phases. Um, upon uh, implementation of all 10 teams, uh, 43 of our 54 First Nations uh, communities uh, will be served. Um, these are um, mental health teams that work um, and provide mental health uh, support services in community as well as a crisis response capability um, in the event of crisis in these communities. And importantly, they're very uh, closely uh, linked to our primary care homes and our interprofessional teams so that we can respond to the broad set of health concerns um, that that person might be experiencing, uh, not just uh, their mental health or substance um, uh, concern. Um, I'd really like to stress uh, the uh, phase one, uh, one of the phase one teams has been Fort St. John's um, mobile support team, currently staffed by three clinicians and about to welcome a fourth clinician. Um, this uh, mobile support team supports five uh, First Nations communities, uh, the Sultu, um, the West Mobile communities, uh, Blueberry, Doig, and Halfway. <coughs> And um, we hear from the First Nations Health Authority, um, who's expressing their thanks on behalf of these communities, that this team uh, has made a big difference uh, for their communities. And they continue to develop uh, the relationship and understanding of the unique uh, needs that are expressed in each of those communities. And trust is deepening, and that allows uh, for greater effect um, of the work of the team, including that connection to the primary care um, home and the interprofessional team. So we're really proud of that. Uh, Fort Nelson is a community in the Northeast that will um, be uh, started as a phase two. And um, this mobile support team uh, will support uh, the nation, uh, the communities of Fort Nelson and Crawford River. Um, in the program, uh, quality improvement uh, is, is a critical focus. And there are two board in, um, endorsed quality improvement goals that the program has been pursuing uh, for uh, some time now. Um, these two quality improvement goals are um, looking at um, for people who have been admitted into our hospitals with a mental health or substance use concern uh, that within 30 days uh, they receive uh, follow-up in community uh, for, for their concern. And our goal um, in this space is to achieve a follow-up rate within 30 days of 90%. Um, and it correlates with our second quality improvement goal, which is to reduce uh, the readmission rate of people with these concerns within 30 days to the hospital. And 
are sitting at about 11.2% now, and um, we are uh, setting a, a higher target of uh, lowering that to 9.9%. Uh, uh, right now, I'm not able to provide to you with the um, uh, specific performance um, that we're achieving at this time. As we integrated um, our uh, community services, including the health, um, uh, the mental health services, we moved our teams from documenting in a, uh, one type of EMR uh, to an integrated community record uh, called CMOS uh, EMR. And in that transition um, period, we have lost um, the ability to track some data. Uh, we are expecting um, that that data blackout, as we call it, uh, would be limited to about six months. Um, notwithstanding the fact that we can't report to you on the exact uh, performance now, um, both of these uh, quality improvement areas continue to be um, an exceptional area of focus for the team. So they're actively pursuing making sure that people are followed up in community and uh, making sure that we don't have uh, inappropriate readmission rates. And so that's my report. Thank you, Kelly. Are there any questions for Kelly? Thank you very much. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, presentation regarding integration in Chetwin. And I'm going to ask uh, our uh, Northeast Chief Operating Officer to introduce the team, please. Sure. So it's my pleasure um, both being here in um, Chetwin and hosting the Northern Health Board meeting. And um, so uh, Jason Rockerson, who is the team leader for the community um, here, uh, the community services in um, Chetwin will be making the presentation. So thank you, Jason. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so uh, a little bit about myself to start with is one is uh, you hired me as a social program officer, not as a presenter. So we'll <laughs> <laughs> right off the bat. <laughs> you won't be judged. Why <laughs> <laughs> <I> so? <laughs> so my uh, uh, the other thing that you need to know is that uh, I do uh, teach a lot of karate. Uh, and in, in that teaching of karate, I tend to move around a lot, so you're in trouble. <laughs> but I also teach that uh, we, um, our bodies feel nervousness and excitement in much the same way. It's only how we think about it. And let me tell you, I am extremely excited. <laughs> I'm excited for a, a number of reasons. Uh, when Peter approached me to to put on a presentation or talk to, uh, talk to you guys, uh, I was a little bit nervous, a little bit hesitant. But then I realized that this is my opportunity, my opportunity to share with you all the great things that are going on in Chapman in terms of integration. Uh, I have two goals. Uh, one is to show you how proud I am of the team that I am honored to be a part of. The second is how proud you should be of the work that is going on in Northern Health in Chuckie as well. I was almost going to say, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Just yes. point it to the machine beside the, no, over here. Just to the laptop. This guy? Yeah. All right. Like I said, not a presenter. <laughs> All good. This is who we are. Uh, so I'm going to move over here. So like I said. So we have two mental health and addictions case managers, uh, four primary care nurses, uh, two casual, uh, two primary care assistants uh, and a casual, two community health workers, and one community uh, licensed practical nurse. And this is her here uh, at the top of Mount Baldy, it's just behind us. And two, what, one or two times a week we get out there and, and either we go running or we, we hike it as a, as a team or uh, whoever might be involved. Uh, the other side of our, our team is the clinic side. Uh, so one clinic manager, who is Lisa Johnson, who is joined us today, uh, five physicians, a nurse practitioner, and four primary care assistants. 
Um, Lisa has uh, been fantastic in trying to integrate the, the doctors and, uh, into our community and set us up to go <coughs> play shooting uh, not too long ago. Um, this one uh, is another, like I said, I'm very proud of these, these people because uh, they put together these presentations, go out into the community to do uh, for our community health fairs and clinics. And, and then um, here we are banded together uh, to about the tragedy in Saskatchewan. This is our favorite team member. <laughs> this is Lola the therapist. Lola is Lisa's um, registered therapy dog and she goes out into the community. What, uh, what we love about Lola is that uh, you can be having the most awful, awful, awful day. And maybe you just come from talking to Peter. <laughs> and you can sit down and pet that dog and your life changes. <laughs> in, in a heart. Love her to Kathy says that you guys will be very uh, aware of this slide here. This is the idealized um, Northern Health System of Service Working Framework for Small Rural Community. I come upon this slide, well actually I stole it off the website, but <laughs> uh, snippet tools are fantastic. Um, yeah, I kind of got this. And I thought, oh, this is this is what you guys think is happening, huh? <laughs> it's a little bit <laughs> it's a little bit different uh, in our You should be stabbed by doing it. Uh it's supposed to see because Chapman is unique and Chapman is our uh, our community. We have uh, some of our partners that are sitting with us today. And, and they would agree that this is, this may have been the roadmap, that, but this is not where we are. And I don't even think that this is where we're going. So I, I took it upon myself to build our own and, and show you what your roadmap that we have, I can, I can send it to you, <laughs> uh, looks like here within our community, right? So I even tried to use the colors, but of course the, the lighting's a little bit different and I'm not very computer savvy like the like song. Looks pretty good. But what we've done, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so what we've done is of course we have the, oh, look at how shaky I am. The person, in it, the person family is right in the center. These are the heart of, of what we do. And then the next, the purple uh, area being our working partnership. These are the people that are working directly with, uh, with our paid people um, doing direct health care. And then on the outside we have our community partners who uh, are adjuncts, our supporters, our critics, our, uh, our cheerleaders. Uh, and our referral sources, uh, and in in that we have friends, extended family, colleagues, and some of these things you might not be able to see. Down in this far corner, these are our helpful fifth partners uh, in other regions. So Dawson Creek General Hospital, Fort St. John, and UNHCC. Um, there's lots to talk about those people. Uh, and here we have our specialists uh, on this side, which is the uh, uh, geriatric assessment team, which is very important to our, our elderly population here. Uh, Dr. Kutza uh, performs teleconference psychiatry for us. Um, um, Dr. O'Harry, who is, uh, also provides us with teleconference for opioid substitution treatment program. You guys called it something different last night. I was scared. So this is a, 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 what we call it at, at this time. It takes a lot of work. And, and what we found, or what I found, is it's not about the policies, procedures. It's about the connections and the relationship building that, that needs to happen. Um, 
and that's invitations out to, out to West Mobile later for uh, Soto or uh, Park Marine or even last night which was really interesting so <laughs> so last night we're sitting here and, and uh, at the end of the, the meeting and and a uh, young lady from the Tansy Friendship Center approaches me and she is the new mental health and addictions case manager uh, had, I I heard through the grapevine that she had gotten this this position, but I hadn't had a chance to go and talk to her. So we sat and we talked, and in our conversations, um, we in that five minutes after everybody had gone, we had come up with a harm reduction plan for our for our community in that partnership in that you know, whatever twenty or thirty minutes, uh, and it's so exciting because I'm the last surviving member of the harm reduction group in Chetland <laughs> and now we have this regrowth. Okay, moving forward. So there are a couple of initiatives that we have done here in Chetland and this is the discharge planning process and I'd like to have invite Peter to come and talk a little bit about the discharge planning and how we come up with a to work for our needs and how we coordinate care coming out of the hospital and, and out of the queue. Sure, thank you. So, um, well, I'm not going to stand here forever. <laughs> I'll be uh, back to this. So, uh, so <coughs> maybe we yeah. should turn down the lights so we can okay. see Andrea's up yeah. there. Okay, so this was a process that was uh, developed earlier this year. And the reason for it was, um, is that in around January, February, we went on diversion because we had too many patients in the hospital. We had, we were 200% of census and uh, we were struggling with our, our staffing um, challenge, our staffing challenges are being addressed. This, uh, this large amount of patients and also our recognition um, that uh, Dawson Creek and District Hospital, which is our primary referral hospitals in the same in the same place as us in terms of large amounts of patients, we had to think about something that looked at um, supporting people um, to <coughs> convalesce or to get better or get their health somewhere other than the hospital. Because the other tendency we were noticing is that we're, there were a number of people who were quite happy, or their families were quite happy, when they came into hospital and they wanted to stay for a while. And we, we really just couldn't accommodate that. So what, what occurred was, is that we looked at, uh, or uh, I looked at, um, did some uh, evidence-based research, looked at, at some models from um, uh, National Health Services in the UK, and also uh, so same thing in, in the United States. We came up with some principles of what was to what the good principles, leading principles were of discharge planning, and then Jason, I, and Laura Lee, our clinical practice lead, got down and started to rough this out. And then we went further than that and gathered input from members of the interprofessional team, Soto uh, First Nations, West Moberly First Nations, and also physicians. Uh, one of the things that you'll you'll note is that. What we try to do, what a, a, a key principle is, is that we need to have contact with the patient really, really quickly. So for us, our benchmark is within uh, three days. So 72 hours to allow for weekends and stuff like that. We have to have a member of an IPT team, uh, of the IPT team come up and visit the patient in the hospital, say we're here. Um, let's start talking about what it's gonna be like when you go home. So we start that seed in, in, their, in their head that they're going to be going home. Uh, uh, because this is a bit of a change for, for folks here, I'm not sure on the rest of the, community, uh, rest of the communities, but once people seem to, to get into hospital, they relax, they settle in and go, okay, I'm all good. You know, we can't really do that at this particular point in time. So one of the things that we do is you'll see some of the, the, the themes running throughout. Um, is that we're always having communication with patient and family. That's the first thing that we commit ourselves to do. We're always looking at an estimated date, date of discharge, uh, and sometimes that's an evolving uh, picture, or frankly, that's an evolving picture. And the whole care, home care plan is developed with the patient and family as well. Um, you can look at some of the, the, the sort of the different phases. This is entirely a homegrown model. 
Um, one of the things that we do is we have um, discharge planning day for us is always on Wednesdays. Soto uh, First Nation, which has the contract for home care for West Moberly, is always invited. Um, physicians will sometimes come in when they see it's appropriate for themselves. And I believe it's starting to work um, fairly well. We don't have that much data to show you yet. Uh, but what has uh, clearly happened is that we're able to support people better in their homes and move them out to their homes a little earlier, which ultimately is going to be better for them. Um, so I think Jason can probably talk to you a little bit more about the sort of the inner workings of this and maybe some uh, definite successes. Uh, he'll be able to better do that. <laughs> I'll take your view. Are there any questions regarding our, our new new discharge plan? And I want to share one other. Uh, I'm getting the time the time <laughs> crunch thing, and I have a couple of more things to share. But uh, and I'm going to try and go through fairly quickly. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to share with you is our prenatal process at that clinic, which is, uh, to my knowledge, it is very unique and. Very exciting at the same time in in terms of what we're doing as, as an ICT and as a as a clinic and a primary care home. So, in the past, you would go to your doctor and find out that you're pregnant, and then you would then uh, might be referred to public health for more information or for more guidance. Then, in you go have a baby. I'm being very simplistic in movie. <laughs> At least that's the way I see it in my mind. <laughs> and then you go have a baby and you come back and you see the doctor and they follow up and then you get your two months. You go to public health, you get your immunize, first immunizations, all from different, generally different nurses, different people. And what we're doing now in, in Chetland is that so first, one, when a, uh, a lady is, is proven to be pregnant, then uh, she's assigned to uh, one of our primary care nurses. And the primary care nurse then does a pre prenatal assessment and does the social history, factor binding, um, and starts building that relationship right away. Then they see the doctor for the follow-up tests and, and uh, I, honestly, I don't know what happens in that doctor's appointment, so I have to have to back out of that one. And when they go and actually have the baby, we get a report back uh, for a postnatal assessment. That same nurse does the postnatal assessment, right? and so what it does is continues that relationship between mother and nurse. And, and in some ways, I think that it becomes more important than the doctor patient relationship as, as a nurse because what we're trying to do now is not only the postnatal but also the two months immunizations I think it's six and twelve uh, all with the same nurse so that there's that constant check-in and what we found is that in that relationship we can start to uh, jump in before you know uh, postnatal depression sets in. We can help with uh, you know, problems very early on because mothers are, are, have built a relationship with our nurses and feel comfortable giving them a call any time during the week to, to ask questions, to get more support, to, to find out, is this normal? Definitely not to me. So that, that to me is one of the most exciting things that we've done in, in terms of primary care. Any questions on that? Is, that? is that what happens in the other communities? I'm curious. I don't, I don't think they have the consistent care provider for the entire time like you're, you're able to do here. Yeah, it is, so again, we are unique, right? We, we're unique in Chetland because we have a small population. We have a small, dedicated group of nurses that are willing to collaborate and work towards you know, 
good care. So Jason, I think you're right. I mean, every community is unique. And as the board travels around and have our meetings in the various communities, we meet with the IPT teams there. And um, everyone does it a little differently. So if you ask if it's the same, no. It's a always a little bit different. But you know, what's encouraging and what we appreciate about your presentation is that your team is being very flexible and adaptable with the model. And as meeting the needs of the community, that's the main goal. That's really good. Well, on that note, <laughs> on that wonder moment, uh, how far we have to go. Uh, this is uh, given to me by one of my good friends uh, from Dawson Creek. Even if you're on the right track, you'll be run over if you just sit there. And that's <laughs> the truth. You gotta keep moving, gotta keep going forward. So we have some challenges and some opportunities that that we face. Um, primary care nurse orientation. The the orientation is huge. It's like it's a it's massive and trying to get them through that process uh, is a full time job for me and, and in a half time position. <laughs> That's my little dick. <laughs> okay. um, a lot of things I I, I I have some problems with the way we're doing things. And I've changed, I was talking a little bit last night, I've changed the, the, the had to cut it down and break it down into smaller bites and smaller things and make small achievable goals for the nurses to try and get through. Um, I'm proud to say that I have one nurse that is 100% through the, the process and fully trained, and another that is now 80%, uh, and uh, the others are still on their, on their journey. Doctor engagement, and I uh, put this word dissonance, um, because mm, they are engaged in certain ways. We're, we're, we're working together, we're working collaboratively. We just want more, right? We want more, we want them to attend more family meetings, more conferences, more discharge plan, uh, uh, planning meetings, uh, more events, more, just more. Um, and the dissonance comes in terms of what they expect from us and what we expect to give. Uh, so they expect that every nurse is there to be hold their hand and to write um, searchers and, and <laughs> uh, medications and uh, anything that they would normally get in the ER or in the acute setting. Um, and certainly not what the primary care nurses are to us. Transportation, uh, locally and regionally. We touched on it a little bit last night, uh, but locally, transportation, we have no bus service or no elder service to in and in around. Um, and that creates, you know, a roadblock and barrier. So uh, what then happens is the ambulance is called usually even for transportation just to the clinic, right? Uh, because there's no, other services, no other wheelchair accessible services. Um, regionally, again, you guys talked a little bit about PTN and some of the challenges last night. Child and youth mental health resources, again, we talked about it and we can't reiterate this enough. We have uh, one clinician. Uh, I tried to get an appointment with a psychiatrist for a client last week and uh, the soonest available for child psychiatry face-to-face is October in Dawson in Dawson Creek. It, it's you know it's almost redundant. Uh, we talked uh, talked a little bit about uh, about how that might work and how it needs to go back to the physician. I got thinking about that and uh, yes, I I absolutely agree. The physicians need to be more involved. Back to that engagement more in that process. Yeah. Can, I, can I just comment? Yes, please. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to minimize um, this experience at all because it is an absolute issue. Um, so what I'm going to say now isn't the whole the whole answer for sure. Um, I think one of the things that we're going to um, and are mobilizing on because it will make a difference is that in the emergency room um, there's an assessment tool called Hearts Now. Um, that's, that allows the clinician to um, assess that child and determine, does this child need more um, intense medical services or um, are more social uh, services required? And I heard that in uh, a story um, about this too. 
uh, young lady. Um, the other piece that we need to work on, and we are within that collaborative conversation that I mentioned in the regional report around a mental health um, service model that includes a child uh, and youth focus, is that we have a circumstance where people, um, I think, want to do the right thing uh, for these kids, um, but, um, but are afraid uh, of, of them. Um, mm -hmm. And so that is not, um, that, that is not a unique experience for nurses, uh, for our GPs, even our psychiatrists. And so there's this um, tendency to think that the only person who can respond to a child's medical needs, higher intensity medical needs uh, for mental health concerns is a child psychiatrist. And what we need to do is um, to scale up um, the skill um, and importantly the comfort and confidence of our other clinicians um, to play their part and, um, and do the most that they can for that child. Um, instead of this, um, uh, it's a blunt um, analysis, but it's the game of hot potato um, with, with these kids. Um, the work that we are, um, with, that we are doing regionally with um, kind of key informants, we can't consult with all of the psychiatrists across the region, can't consult with all of our GPs or all of our nurses, etc. But with the core uh, group that we are working um, with, um, we're trying to reach um, that place of understanding that we all agree that that is the best thing for these kids, um, that we all um, need to uh, practice to the top of our scope uh, for these kids and not pass them on um, if we don't have to. Um, I think um, we need to do, and when I say we, I mean um, the royal we, but it includes me um, regionally with our um, uh, informant group is we need to reach agreement then on what are the relative roles and contributions of each level of service provider then in service of these kids. And then some core principles, like if you are working to the top of your scope, um, that one of the successes is that the child uh, receives care as close to home as possible. And that is so important, not only for the child, but also the family and the aftercare uh, that's required. So not just responding to the immediate uh, crisis, but um, all of the things that might uh, present for that child. So I just tell you that story not to minimize what you're experiencing no, no. here, but those are the conversations that we need to have. We have a very good relationship with BC uh, Children's Hospital, who has essentially said to us, look, um, we want to help um, and walk alongside you, um, Northern um, physicians and psychiatrists and, and nurses, etc., and we will do that. Um, but you need to do your part, and then when you find that you're out of your depth, um, give us a call, and even if it's not quite in our scope, we will walk alongside you and support that child um, remotely, even through telehealth. So we need to solidify that, um, and we need to validate it with all of our communities, because the community's um, particular experience of this challenge is always slightly uh, nuanced, etc. Mm -hmm. But um, I do hope it offers you some um, comfort and confidence um, that there's some very intensive work um, uh, going on in this space because it, it, it is a really serious issue. And, and it's, a, it's actually very uh, helpful to know that that, that is that work mm -hmm. in the background is happening and that, that uh, our voices are being heard. Uh, you know, because uh, uh, And I think that it does go back to that, is that, that doctor comfort in dealing with it. And we're asking our nurses and our, our practitioners to, to, to help support families, but a lot of times it's, it's doctors and, and psychiatrists, all of those good people. Thank you. Um, as good as we are, I think we need to, to, to stay focused on this part here, the person family centered care. And that's where we met, or where we seen at the first at the point of care leadership conference just a couple weeks ago, um, and that was one of the things that was uh, uh, present presented, and it got me thinking that this is where we need to keep our focus uh, as a team and as a community and as to the work. We do great work already. We can do better, and that and that's the part of always going forward. Um, uh, my last closing remark, I'd like to just share with you my, my team and I did, uh, did a, a team building exercise in January and 
they came up with our goals and our mission statement for for the integration work here in Chapel. So our goal is fostering healthy communities. Okay? And our mission statement is promoting holistic family and centered family and client centered care across the lifespan. And that's a this is our goal. This is our mission. Um, thank you and I hope that this is <laughs> Thank you, Jason, very much. Does any director have a question for Jason or Peter? Well presented. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Always great to hear from what happens at the ground level. Thank you. Okay. The last section of our meeting is uh, governance and management relations, and I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Garav to introduce the subject. So our government and governance and management relations committee met on May 25th, and as part of that meeting, we discussed our our board and policy manual, and there was a, a there's a series of different uh, uh, manuals that we look at each each session, mm -hmm. and we vet them and go through them. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Kathy to comment on those. So the board 200 series was the series that we looked at, the board role and governance overview, um, the uh, communication policy, and. The uh, executive limitations, which is the policy that outlines what the CEO is able to, has authority to undertake and what, um, where that limit is. And then the facility and funding policy, which is a pretty lengthy policy because of the connection with the uh, Ministry of Health in relation to naming of any assets. And then Board 260, the corporate conduct um, policy. So those are the Board 200 series. The, the edits uh, from Governance and Management uh, Relations Committee were minor um, changes. Right. And those are at page 40 of the materials. So there is a motion attached to this. It's uh, that the Northern Health Board approves the revised Board 200 series. I'll move that. Yes. Are there, is there any questions or discussion around that? Okay. Um, all in favor? Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, and then we'd like to move to the emergency preparedness. Uh, this is uh, a result of the wildfires and, and what the learnings are after the wildfires. And Steve, uh, turn it over to Steve Raper to talk about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a short briefing note in there, as, as many of us all recall, there was uh, six weeks from July 7th to August 23rd where our operations were significantly impacted by uh, not only residents to the communities, but the fact that we were that we were uh, running facilities in, in uh, dormitories and college gyms and things like that. Um, and we're still, I, 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 probably fair to say, we're still recovering from some of that work uh, um, on, a, on, a, on probably an organizational-wide level because of what really was an all-hands-on-deck on death <laughs> process. In this is the final formal after-action review. There's a lengthy document. I won't go in there. I'll touch on a few highlights. Um, from that that came out of that uh, that report. Jim Fitzpatrick deserves a lot of credit, him and his team. He, they put a lot of time interviewing across the entire organization, <coughs> gathering a lot of information from internal and external stakeholders to, to come up with a report that uh, captured and summarized what we did, what we did well, what we could work on, and some of the recommendations coming forward. The recommendations, and there is an extensive list in the back of the after action report, are really themed into uh, uh, eight key areas. I don't think many of them are surprising, internal communications, staffing resources, emergency preparedness infrastructure, external communications, indigenous partners, demobilization, and public health. Probably the biggest learning was the demobilization process, something that we hadn't gone through and uh, nor would you normally ever expect to go through. So working through that was a big piece of work on that. I won't go into much more detail except to highlight there is a quick summary on page 80 of your report that has the after action report tracker, some of the things that we've already implemented and initiated uh, in preparation for what could potentially be another fire season. Um, which includes things like five-minute code drills, a satellite phone protocol, uh, quick reference evacuation guides, 
uh, hazardous material decontamination training, et cetera. So some of these things have been completed or are in the, the process of being completed. And they're just a highlight of some of the after action recommendations that are listed there. And uh, those are all included in your report. So I'll leave it at that for... Uh, well, we, we certainly hope that we don't have another wildfire season <laughs> like last year, but uh, if we do, we're yeah. prepared. Lots of seconders for that. <laughs> yes, it was a very stressful and burdensome time for our health authority. And I just want to say I, and I'm sure the board, couldn't be more proud of the work that Northern Health did in managing that uh, episode last summer. So I agree. Let's hope that that doesn't happen again. So the next topic on uh, on the agenda is the Northern Connections update, which is dealing with the uh, the Northern Health bus, which is particularly interesting because of what's happening with Greyhound. Yes, yeah, so we've been uh, working with the Ministry of Transportation and Ministry of Health as they uh, implemented their new BC Bus uh, North program. We'd also been partnering with BC Transit and communities on the Highway 16 corridor and the work along there through BC Transit and of course some of the uh, funded programs that are being offered through, uh, through Indigenous communities to provide locally based solutions. One of the things that we've, we've done uh, as a first step, which has been, uh, we're already seeing some significant uh, bookings, is under the social determinants of health, expanding what we would consider eligibility under those determinants. Uh, the categories that we really felt that it was appropriate to look at in early stages are those requiring mobility lift. All of our buses are equipped with mobility lifts and wheelchair accessible washrooms. So right off the top, we felt that that was an appropriate category in terms of providing service to a, to a group that's extremely vulnerable without appropriate transportation. So we felt that without an appointment, because it is a service that requires an appointment, we felt that this was still inappropriate and we will track why they're traveling and things of that nature. Uh, the other group that we opened it up to was uh, people over the age of 60. Um, and we were, we'd been working towards this and a recent Seniors Advocate report really reinforced our thinking on that, which is that transportation is a significant determinant of long-term health for seniors. Um, and not necessarily health appointments, but if we want to keep 60 plus non seniors <laughs> safe at home uh, longer and in their communities longer and not uh, in the healthcare system and in uh, assisted living facilities and residential care facilities, transportation can be a significant uh, impact or barrier to that. Um, so we have opened it up, and I'm pleased to say that is probably the single biggest rise in our booking since we've opened that up. Uh, only in, only for a couple of weeks, um, we're seeing uh, a large increase in the number of uh, 60 plus that are interested in riding the bus for a variety of reasons. Sadly, uh, one of the number one tracked reasons is funerals, um, which was you know a little bit of a uh, an interesting takeaway that we've already got in terms of the data because we are tracking why they travel. We felt that that was important information as well for our reporting back. The last two categories is the companion area where we've made some flexibility. Um, we've worked on flexibility specifically to uh, uh, the travel companions, which is a free companion if somebody requires assistance in traveling, uh, but oftentimes it required them and they would be leaving behind a child or another, or another individual that they were caring for. So we've, we've provided some flexibility in terms of that companion that if you need to take a second companion with you, it is at fair. Um, but uh, but we can have some. We do. We are we are offering immediate family flexibility there. The other one, which is really important, and it's a bit of a different take, is what we're calling um, uh, more of a compassion companion. What we've learned is there are people that have to leave the community for healthcare services, whether it be maternity or surgical. They're required to be in another community for a longer period of time, whether that be recovery in the hospital after post surgery, things of that nature and their support networks are available there. So we have opened up the bus for those folks to, tra to travel without an appointment to visit and support people that are in facility or in another community requiring care, knowing full well that that support will, is, and the evidence supports that, helps their ability to recover and get back home into their community. So we felt under the umbrella of social determinants, providing some travel for people that are required supporting caregivers, eligible immediate family members, that we think that category is a very important category to keeping people healthy and getting them back into their communities and thriving in their communities. So those are the main changes. I've highlighted a number of our features that set us aside from the other services, why it's a booked appointment service. Um, it, it will still remain priority for people with health appointments because uh, folks with dialysis and things like that, it is an absolutely necessary service. 
and we need to maintain some flexibility recognizing our services change as we introduce MRIs and, and we run into staffing shortages and things like that. Some flexibility is essential. So uh, we've seen an immediate bump in terms of our uh, uh, passenger count and booking. So we will be monitoring that over the next year. Um, and making some additional changes if we need. I will say, um, because the service along the Highway 16 corridor is fairly extensive now, there's, there's a number of modalities and a number of transportation that we are looking very closely uh, at the Northeast and making some changes that we're hoping to make in the, within the next six weeks uh, around some routes and uh, some, some additional stops that might uh, provide some benefit to, <coughs> to the people in the North. So we're working on that right now. Uh, with an expected solution in the next little while. So we've moved quite considerably away from our original premise, which was to just uh, have this bus for health appointments. And even though it's not our mandate, we're not the Ministry of Transportation, we've gone above and beyond to find different areas where we can use this bus. Absolutely, we, we have. We still feel, though, it, 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 it meets the mandate of health, being under the social determinants of health. So, so whilst we've stretched it and, and, and massaged the boundaries, we feel that it is it is uh, staying true to our core mandate, which is making sure that people that require health care, health care support, or, or have accessibility issues or have a service that they can turn to. We've also felt, and this, was, this is coming out in the various options, that multiple modalities are necessary. A one-size-fits-all solution would be very difficult to apply across the entire region, so going to multiple modalities uh, utilizing various transports, community solutions uh, via rail where it's available, um, have all, all all serve a purpose and all serve a role, and we're a piece of that pie, and, and, and I think that's an important piece. Thanks, Steve. Okay, the last uh, point on the agenda is to d talk about our 2017 and 2018 annual report. And that's Steve again. Yes, so we are one of the only health authorities. I still think we might be the only health authority that produces a traditional annual report. There is different forms of reporting that are required by ministry, but we've always done a board report to the community. Um, one of the things, because we are changing our website, and I know the, uh, the board's got a sneak preview of what that looks like, we categorize the information in a much different fashion. So producing a formal strategic plan that's incredibly comprehensive has become a bit redundant in the sense that the information is going to be available in, in, in spaces on the web uh, very easily and very accessibly. So what we are proposing uh, is to uh, alter the, the annual report, get to a more streamlined, succinct version, um, using some infographic type of uh, layout uh, to make it a little bit more appealing, a little bit more succinct, and much more uh, effective as a document for our public, uh, as opposed to a formal, larger, comprehensive report where that information is accessible in a different manner. So, we think it's the right thing to do. We've been, tr we always track our, our traffic to that. Um, we know that it's an important document, but we think that this is the right next step uh, in in combining with our new our new web features. And when is that going to be available to the general public? The the, the new website. Um, well, within about six weeks, we're planning the date to launch the new website. And you all have access to uh, provide us some feedback now. You're the the last check in the stop. It has been uh, uh, done uh, with cooperation from the Seniors Advocates Office and Patient Voices Network. So we've done a lot of work making sure that it's not built. Sorry to say for you, it's built <laughs> for our consumers, um, and that's a really important piece of that. Um, that works so happy to hear your feedback absolutely but we think with this new way we've laid this out um, the annual report can take a bit more of a succinct and I think if anything a more colorful and uh, um, visually appealing format good work Steve thank you yes thank you Steve Garrow thank you any questions for Garrow or Steve <coughs> okay so with that that concludes our public meeting I'd like to thank you all for attending those who are tuning in um, I'd like to remind the board that we will be meeting right after this adjournment with the um, Peace River Regional Hospital District representatives. We will have a lunch meeting with them. So again, I thank you all. I'm asking now for a motion to adjourn. Rosemary? And Frank. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned.
Uh, we're standing at the Wabi Playground. It's the first of two block parties uh, we're uh, hosting today and tomorrow. Today we're at uh, Wabi Crescent, tomorrow we're in the Crown Sub. And this is, um, we can call it years one and two of Chetwin's Playground Revitalization Program. We're looking at uh, putting $50,000 a year towards the various playgrounds in, in town. This equipment is actually, although it looks brand new, it's actually already a year old. Uh, we got it a little bit late last year and with the early um, winter that came on us, we, we couldn't get it put in last year. So uh, from a very generous donation from Somerville Acon of $10,000, we were able to install it this year and kids uh, look to be enjoying it. It's a, it's a pretty big day. It's a three-way partnership between the District of Chetwin, Moccasin Flats and Somerville Lake on. So if I can ask um, you guys to come up and say a few words on behalf of Moccasin Flats. I, I would just like to thank the district for uh, the tremendous amount of work they've done. I'm, I'm a lifelong resident of the street, born and raised on the street. Our original first playground was back in the bush. This had some uh, <laughs> wooden, yeah, that was just true. Back in the bush behind Blanche's place, another original. Uh, do you remember that Blanche? Kicking us out of there quite often, <laughs> making too much noise. <laughs> No, but this this is awesome for the district to come in and doing what they've done. Uh, it's it keeps the kids off the street. It's this is just uh, very welcome. I see my grandkids running around. My kids grew up on this street playing in the uh, well the swings that we had. But uh, no, this is awesome. Great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Oscar. you. And we have another special guest with us. It was, um, oh, about seven or eight months ago. We actually got this equipment last year and we ran out of time to put it up. It was in October and that, that early winter came. And I remember sitting in a meeting and uh, Somerville Acon was up. And they just knew that we had this playground equipment around and said that they wanted to give something back a little bit to the community. They made it their home here for quite a few months. Uh, a lot of people were up working and they very generously donated $10,000 for us to uh, assemble this playground. So Cy from Somerville Acon is up and if we can just have a big round of applause for yes. both these organizations for, for what they've offered us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No problem at all. Uh, we just want to thank the town for letting us come in. We know we brought quite a few people in and they welcomed us with open hands and just to show some appreciation. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the District of Chetwin, it's our pleasure to uh, help bring this park here. It looks fantastic and the kids that have gathered around, thanks, but I know I'm probably pretty boring to listen to. You don't feel you have to sit here on my account, just go back there and <laughs> scream and yell all you want is what it's here for. And um, I think personally that these parks are pretty special. Um, you're going to get neighborhood kids that didn't know each other, that uh, you'll see them making lifelong friendships that initiate here. You'll have new mothers that bring their kids here in the same time each day and friendships are going to be formed there and you'll probably see a few immature fathers like me swinging on the swing sets and that thing over there looks like a lot of fun. I'll probably be on that a little bit later on too. So this is a lot of fun and it's... Um, the rest of the playgrounds around town are going to be getting facelifts like this too, one every year. So it's my pleasure to open up this park. Hey, uh, this is uh, the second block party in, in two days here in Chetwin. This is the second park that uh, has gone through the revitalization program. Um, after Wabi Crescent yesterday, this is the Crown Sub Park right now. And they've been without a park for a couple of years due to some safety concerns and, and whatnot. So. It's, uh, it's up and functional now, and it looks, looks great, and more to come in the next three years. The difference between um, this park and the one yesterday is uh, the one yesterday had a couple of additional sponsors to it. This one is solely on the District of Chetwin, uh, this particular pl uh, playground today. So we're at our second block party in, in two days. Uh, it's wonderful for Chetwin. This is again two years worth of uh, playground revitalization of a, of a five-year plan. And hopefully you can see behind me the new playground equipment right there. This is kind of a nice moment for me. My daughter grew up playing over there in the old playground equipment, so 
this is uh, kind of full circle. And uh, the this has been without for I think two years. Um, the old one got taken down, and and sadly, when insurance companies come in and say that there's playground equipment that's no longer meets today's standard for the safety of our children, we have to take it down and, and make plans for a new one. So it's sad that we've been without it for a couple of years, but we're very, very happy and pleased to open up the new playground and uh, very pleased that it's nice and safe for all of our children to play on for years to come. So this little man is gonna help me with these giant pairs of scissors, okay? And what do you, do you wanna say, let's open up the park? Say it. Open up the park. Yeah. <laughs> And I'd like to uh, uh, introduce a couple of people. This is our ambassador program in Chetwin. This is fairly new to town, but not too new. Uh, they're run out of the library. This is Kayla McDonald and April White. And there are two of how many people uh, part of the program? Oh, jeez. I couldn't get that number to you. Oh, eight. Eight. And anyhow, it's, it's, it's nice to say that it's for new people in town, but it isn't. It might just be for somebody that's uh, a change. Maybe you're a new parent, um, I don't know, newly single, newly married. I don't know if you're just uh, wondering what's out there in town to do and what different activities and different clubs and events to be part of. Go and check them out at the library. Uh, it's open to anybody and, and everything. Is, is there anything you'd like to add? You want to try out a new hobby too. A new hobby. Yep, they got information on anything, and, and our library in town is wonderful. If, uh, if you need something that they don't offer, uh, if there's a need for it, they'll come up with it. So just show up and ask. And enjoy. Yeah.